All right, so I'm going to go over my glazing process with these forms and talk a little bit about the layering that I put uh, into these uh, during the glazing process. Um, I want to talk just briefly about why I layer glazes and the visual effect that I want. So uh, I came to um, oxidation cone 5 firing from uh, previous work in high fire reduction kilns and so the atmospheric firing was was of interest to me and when I moved to oxidation I wanted to make sure I didn't lose uh, some of the depth that you get from those glaze surfaces. So my immediate plan for how to resolve that was to heavily texture surfaces and then layer in oxides or underglazes um, under the actual glaze surface to create some depth. So initially I just experimented with a lot of textures and, and found textures that I liked. You can see that the pitting is still left there from um, the uh, texture tool. And I uh, used uh, various types of oxides and uh, carbonates and really came to work with uh, most primarily black copper oxide. So uh, black copper oxide, just mix the powder with water and get it into sort of a water color consistency. You want it fairly drippy, yeah, just a little bit more. And what this does for the surface, I'll brush it in um, and it gets into the small crevices and then I'll take a sponge and pull it away from the high surfaces and it leaves the concentrated black copper oxide uh, in the, the divots and the, the small creases. Um, and that will burn through uh, the glaze and we'll talk about that in just a minute but I'll go ahead and apply some of this. So it's pretty easy to get on the surface here, you just brush it in. And with the pitting, if I've got heavier pitting, I make sure that I dab it in. This is the first layer that I'll put on, and you can kind of work in sections. Um, it's oftentimes easier to do that so you don't have the oxide getting smeared all over. And you just take a sponge, start to pull it away. You have to sort of clean the sponge out frequently. And if you pull too much away in a certain area, you can always go back and reapply. Um, it's a good idea to use uh, rubber gloves with this. Um, the copper oxide is, is not something you're going to absorb into your skin. However, um, it is something that you probably don't want to have you know, in your cuticles and, and just you know, into your hands where you may get into food or something later. So, and I use a fair amount of this. So if this is a, any process that you use on every piece, you want to be careful about what type of exposure you have to that, uh, maybe on a daily or weekly basis. So you just want to protect yourself from that. And usually with this process, um, I'll work this surface and get the whole piece finished. It'll start to dry pretty quickly. And I can, I can work straight through on a piece. Uh, usually by the time I'm done uh, applying the, the oxide wash over the whole form, I can go back and start selectively uh, brushing glaze on, on the areas that I want to start to color. And so I'll go ahead and transition to that so you can see how this would be basically on the whole form as we're working on it. And I want to talk a little bit about the bands. So the glaze base that I use, um, I have one, one glaze recipe that I use and I just use different um, combinations of oxides and carbonates and mason stains. Uh, for them. So uh, for the black coloration where I have the very metallic black right in here, all the bands, um, that is actually my glaze base with 10% black copper oxide. So that's just the straight black copper oxide in the glaze base. And so um, the application for that is relatively simple. So after the stain has been applied, I go around all the areas of black banding and just carefully apply this uh, black copper oxide glaze. All right, so then within this type of form, um, I would hit all of these black band areas, um, all of the pipe parts, so anything that's untextured um, that will not have the pitting in the black copper oxide, um, I will apply uh, that to. And I'll do that first. 
the black copper oxide burns through and is such a strong colorant that um, if I over brush onto my glaze, it'll stain that. But if I brush the glaze color over the black copper oxide, the black copper oxide kills whatever color was in that. So I, I don't have to be as precise working the other direction. So when I work with uh, this orange glaze here, sort of an orangish brown tone, um, as I'm brushing along here, if I actually get glaze onto the black banding, you won't even tell. You can't even tell in the final firing. This is a color that turns this sort of orangish brown. And so I'm gonna go ahead and start applying this. And again, with this process, um, I'm gonna dab and brush. Make sure that I'm filling all those little crevices where the oxide has been laid in. What I use as a rule of thumb on, on the colorants, um, I use, as I mentioned, mason stains, um, Harshaw, and any stains that I can get a hold of that are the color range I want, and use them at 10% uh, of the recipe base. So, uh, and that's my, my guide. If I need to move it up or down outside of that, I can, but that's what I usually start with. And that usually is pretty true. If it's a particularly expensive stain, if I get a color response that I like, I might run another test or two to see if I can get that same color response with 5% um, or whether it needs to be the 10% to get the, the range. Um, because the black copper oxide is so dark and comes through um, the glaze in such a dark fashion, there is a limit to the palette that I can use and have that show up. So I've got to work with lighter colors or all of the work texturing and everything doesn't actually show up. All right, so that's one application through on those areas that have been stained. Um, dries quickly enough to go ahead and actually start in on a second coat. So um, after one, you can go ahead and brush a second coat and you can start to see that thickness layer up. And as I mentioned, I don't have to be super careful about where I'm applying it in relationship to the black stains. So um, there's little, little dots of the orange glaze that have gotten on there and there's little bits and pieces that have brushed up against. The black copper oxide in that glaze is thick enough that it'll still turn black no matter what is happening over that. So if I were to reverse those and put the orange on first and put the black over and over brush the black, the black would show up anywhere where I did that. So I can, I can be um, a little bit less clean with this, this order of things. Once these have been glazed um, and fully glazed, then I go ahead and uh, make sure that the bottoms are cleaned up. I make sure there's not any extra glaze underneath. Again, on a form like this that has uh, sections connecting to, to it, I would have a shrink slab that what I would put underneath it, uh, kiln shelf, put grog down, then put the shrink slab, put another thin layer of grog, and then actually set the pot on that um, for the glaze firing and uh, put it in and fire it to cone five in an oxidation kiln um, and, and it is done. So there's a few um, details with the glaze. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this is the black glaze by itself and it really does get sort of a nice gunmetal sheen to it. The copper oxide underneath the glaze will burn through um, in variations depending on how thick it's applied. So where you have some of the thinner spots where there's, uh, the crevices are less deep into the surface of the bisque. Um, the copper will come through sometimes in sort of a greenish fashion, maybe a little bit of a gray color. And then the deeper crevices where there's more oxide will be black and, and make a stronger mark. Also, some of the glaze variations, depending on how light the glaze is, you'll get some color variations. So this gray glaze, um, you get not just the black, but you get some of the green happening um, and that'll affect the surface. Some of the colorants that I use um, have um, some variation in terms of their thickness. So this pink glaze that I use in particular is really suspect to thickness. If it's on too thin, it turns gray. And so it really needs to be 
uh, three full coats um, to actually turn this color. So um, anytime I'm testing out these glazes, I'll have small test tiles and I'll do brush coat testing on different thicknesses. So I'll brush one coat on the whole tile and then I'll go over to the left hand corner and brush a second coat and then the right hand corner and brush a third coat to see you know, where, where the best color response is. Occasionally, and this is a good example of, of a joined piece with uh, these seams here. Once in a while, I do get a little separation on some of these areas. Um, it's, it's rare, but um, the oxide glaze is thick enough that usually those uh, start to fill in. So if I, they come out of the bisque kiln, there's just a little hairline crack there. It's rare that those cracks actually um, get any worse or even show through the thickness of that glaze. And so um, that's a nice added bonus for uh, that black metallic glaze um, on that surface.